Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my March wrap up and this may be coming as much of a shock to you as it is to me that I'm actually going to film a wrap up this year because I did in fact read several books in March. Uh, I think in total this year, I think I counted, I think I've read 10 books. The majority of them were in March. I did DNF quite a bit in March as well and I'm just not going to speak about those books here. I've decided not to feel guilty about DNFing. So I did have one stellar read at the very beginning of March that I filmed an entire reading vlog around and I just flew through this book. And this is the only classic that I read this month and it is in fact the only classic I have read this year. Uh, and that is Demian by Herman Hesse. So this is a modern classic, kind of a coming of age story. Uh, and it's a very difficult book to describe and I actually think it's a very difficult book to recommend to someone. But I read it kind of going hand in hand with sort of my BTS or Nam June reading project. Nam June is the leader of BTS and he reads quite a bit and one of my goals this year was just to kind of make my way through his reading list and a lot of the books he's recommended I haven't gotten on with. <laughs> and I DNF to several of them. But this is one that was just truly electrifying to me. And so I do have an entire vlog dedicated to this, so I won't spend much time on it. But this is not only my favorite book of the year so far, it is in fact one of my new favorites of all time. I just found this so impactful and really, really memorable. I, I can't even describe the way that this book made me think and the way it made me reflect on myself, the way it made me reflect on society at large. I mean, there was so much happening in this book. It was so cerebral. Uh, and so I have since ordered everything else Herman Hesse ever wrote. <laughs> and I am waiting on those books to arrive and I can't wait to dive into them. Next, we had the Caritathon, which was a week long readathon, just basically kind of encouraging us to really explore Korean culture. And so uh, the goal was to read a bunch of Korean books. And I think in total, I only managed to finish two. I only brought two down here, but that's okay. And a week long readathon, when I haven't been reading two books in a week is amazing to me. Now, one of them was very, very small. And that was Kim Ji Young, born 1982. And I also mentioned these two in a vlog. So I'll try to keep these brief as well. But this is kind of a feminist book and it's now a bit of a classic in Korea that apparently took Korea by storm uh, when it was originally published. And I've seen mixed reviews on it since picking it up. Originally, I only heard positive things, but once I picked it up, I heard a lot of people saying that it was basically just very run of the mill. And I think it was an interesting thing because the people saying that were women. And I think it was that if you are a woman, so much of this book will feel rote to you because you will have experienced it. Uh, and specifically uh, to women, who are from Asia. This speaks to kind of the larger Asian experience of women and not just women in Korea, which is really interesting. And the parts of the book that stuck out to me were those elements that were very Korea specific. Instances where sexism is literally baked into the structure of Korean society in places. There was so much going on here that I just found genuinely interesting. And I think Initially, when I started reading this, I thought it maybe should have just been a nonfiction. It should have just been maybe an essay. But by the end, I understood why the author chose to write a fictional narrative because the ending of this book is so infuriating. I, I can't even express to you the rage I felt when I closed this book. A lot of this book you spend infuriated. A lot of this book you spend really angry. But a lot of this book you also just feel tired uh, if you were a woman because though much of the book is about the Korean experience of women and then more broadly kind of the East Asian experience of women, there are so many elements of the book that are just kind of known to all women. All women have experienced some of the things that the main character Kim Ji Young experienced. So I think there is a level of fatigue with it. And so I can see why this has wound up with some mixed reviews, but I also definitely see why this book took off in the way that it did and why it became such a conversation piece. So I wound up rating this four stars. At the end of the book, I really felt like the book was a success, but towards the beginning of the book, I was just very, 
very tired and I didn't really see the point of making it a novel, by the end I understood exactly what the author was doing. And so I kind of encourage you to pick this up and just see what you think about it. I'm immediately going to pass this on and hope that it winds up in someone's hands who needs it. Then I picked up The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea by Axie O. This was a book that I pre-ordered and I'll be real with you, the reason I pre-ordered this book was because of this cover. I mean this cover it's just so beautiful. I don't have words for it. But so this is a retelling of a Korean myth where a girl kind of goes beneath the sea and marries the sea god and tries to save her village. Her village is like being plagued by all of these storms. And this started out on such a high note for me that I really truly believed this book was just going to be everything that I wanted at that moment in time because I was thinking, kind of dealing through this slump, that really what I need is something pacey and something quick. And that's exactly what this is, but this is too fast paced for me. You never get a chance to breathe and you also feel like you never really get a chance to know some of the characters or to take a moment and appreciate the character development that has occurred. And so it takes place across what you would think is a very short time span, but there will be instances here and there where the characters will mention, well, that happened two or three weeks ago. And you're thinking, what? You never really experienced that passage of time. So it just felt weird to me. And this book is YA. And I'm trying to tell myself that really in the end, I can't review YA books the same way I can adult books. I'm no longer in the YA age range. I just read it because I don't think you can get these stories anywhere else. And I wish you could get them in adult. I really wish you could, but I think a lot of what YA is doing is just so indicative of YA. I think YA is so inclusive and diverse and is doing a lot of really creative things. The stories that I want to read still seem to come out in the YA genre or age range. YA is not a genre. And so I'm still compelled to pick up a lot of YA because I feel like they're doing what's fresh. I am not compelled by nearly anything coming out in adult fantasy recently. And so I do feel as though I can't really review this objectively. This book is not meant for me. And I think it is one of the few YA books that I have read in recent years that does actually feel like it is geared towards its age range. That's something that YA is struggling with, in my opinion, is that it has grown with my generation, who was maybe the first generation to truly experience the YA boom. People are still writing for those of us younger millennials. And they are kind of ignoring the generation that is coming of age right now that is who these books should be written for. So I respect the fact that Axio really did know her audience and she wrote this specifically for a YA crowd, uh, but I wound up rating it three stars. I thought it was good, but I did not think it was great. I did carry on with reading a couple more YA books this month and both of these were kind of fast paced thrillers, which I thought would work well for me because the only books I've really been able to finish this year other than these had been thrillers. And so I have thought that maybe something pacey, but also something where you had to figure something out, kind of a mystery, would probably help me get out of my slump. And so I read The Mary Shelley Club by Goldie Moldavsky. And this is such a strange book. I really don't know how to describe this. So there is like a secret society at a school that plays these really violent pranks on people and basically tries to scare someone to death. And really the book is in so many ways an homage to the horror genre and specifically the horror movie genre. With Mary Shelley's name on the title, you would probably think they're gonna talk a little bit more about horror books. That's not really what happened here. This, this was really an homage, I'm gonna say it, to Scream. And if you have seen Scream, you have read this book. <laughs> so there was a lot of this that was very thematically similar to Scream and very tongue in cheek in the same way that Scream is kind of just having fun and poking fun at the genre, which is something that I really enjoy. Scream is one of the few horror movies that I can tell you I truly love. Uh, so I really liked some of what this book was doing, but it also had a character problem because the pacing was so quick and because the characters really wanted to keep secrets from us as the reader as well as from each other. There was a real distance between 
you and the characters throughout the book. So I ultimately didn't care what happened either way because I didn't feel an attachment to anyone. I will say it took me a minute to figure out what was going on and to figure out who like the real culprit is because this does eventually morph into a true mystery. Things are going on that uh, the main character and the group that are playing these pranks are not apparently doing. And so they start suspecting each other, wondering what's going on. And so that was the part of it that was really enjoyable to me and that I actually didn't figure out right off the bat. So I really appreciated that. But I found Goldie Moldovsky's writing to be kind of stilted as well. So I know she's rather large in kind of the realm of YA horror, but I have never read anything by her. And I don't know that I will again, but I do really appreciate that this was just one book and that she's apparently not gonna turn this into a series uh, because the opportunity was there, but she didn't take it. Unlike this next book that I read, which I wish was not a series, and I don't know that I'm gonna carry on with it. That's The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. I had a lot of fun with this. I can see why this has taken everyone by storm. I am so mad that this book is a series because I've heard so many terrible things about the second book in this that I knew when I picked this up, I probably wasn't gonna carry on. So I was hopeful that the door would be closed on a lot of plot lines in a satisfactory way so I wouldn't feel the need to pick up the next book. But I kind of do, I kind of do feel compelled to. Unlike the past two books that I've discussed, this book did not have a character problem. The characters in this were easily the strong point of the book. This is kind of Knives Out in fashion, where someone outside of this really rich family winds up inheriting everything when the patriarch of the family dies, and no one knows why. She doesn't even understand why. And one of the conditions of inheriting all of this money is that she has to live for a year in the house with all of uh, the patriarch's grandsons, which you can see where this is going. But I really, really enjoyed it. I had a fun time with this in a way that I didn't really expect to. This was really compelling. I felt like I couldn't put this book down. And I think I maybe read it in one or two days, which has been unusual for me lately. I just found myself constantly thinking about this. This similarly had an element to figure out, but I unfortunately knew what it was. And the whole time in this book, this really robbed me of some enjoyment of it, is that I knew where this was going because I have watched someone on booktube. I don't know who it was now, but someone on booktube essentially spoiled what the main mystery element of this book was, but said it in such a way that I thought it must be on the back of the book, that it was something that people would figure out in the first hundred pages, that it was a very obvious thing. So the whole time I'm reading, I'm wondering, well, why is everybody acting like this is a mystery? Because we know what it is and they're about to reveal it. And the whole time I felt like that other shoe was gonna drop and it didn't come until near the very end of the book. And I realized, wow, this was actually the linchpin of the story. And I thought it was just one part of the whole. So I do feel like some of my enjoyment of this book was definitely robbed because I didn't spend any time trying to figure out something that was clearly the mystery. But I did really enjoy the characters and part of me enjoyed the characters so much that I'm willing to read the second book. But this was very Knives Out and I think if you've watched Knives Out, you will recognize a lot of the character archetypes in this book. And that does kind of lead me into a critique of the characters actually, though I really liked them. Uh, the male characters in particular just felt like different, really famous, YA male archetypes that just moved about the story and they never felt any deeper than that. But you know what? Who cares? It was fun. I enjoyed it so much that that didn't really bother me, but I do feel like looking back, a lot of these characters were pretty surface level. Last but not least is my historical fiction section. And I wanna say that I feel like historical fiction has just defined the month of March for me. I have read some amazing, amazing historical fiction this month, and I am currently in the middle of a couple of others. So I did misspeak. I think this does also qualify as a modern classic, but Svea and I read together the memoirs of Hadrian this month, and what a book this was. She and I both felt 
instantaneously when we first started reading this, we both said this to each other, that we instantly felt like this book was special and like it was going to become an all-time favorite. And that's definitely what it has become for me. It's not really as long as what you think it is, but you spend such a long amount of time trying to process the language and just spending time in the language. This is genuinely one of the most beautifully written books I have ever read. Uh, and it's up there with Damien for me as a favorite of the year because Damien was similarly beautifully written. I mean, listen at him just talking about poetry. They taught me to enter into the thought of each man in turn and to understand that each makes his own decisions and lives and dies according to his own laws. The reading of the poets had still more overpowering effects. I am not sure that the discovery of love is necessarily more exquisite than the discovery of poetry. Poetry transformed me. Initiation into death itself will not carry me farther along into another world than does a dusk of Virgil. And here is one of his quotes on love. And Svea and I both got choked up at this, so I hope I can read it. The slightest and most superficial of contacts are enough for us with most persons, or prove even too much. But when these contacts persist and multiply about one unique being, to the point of embracing him entirely, when each fraction of a body becomes laden for us with meaning as overpowering as that of the face itself, when this one creature haunts us like music and torments us like a problem, instead of inspiring us in us at most mere irritation, amusement, or boredom, when he passes from the periphery of our universe to its center and finally becomes for us more indispensable than our own selves, then that astonishing prodigy takes place wherein I see much more an invasion of the flesh by the spirit than a simple play of the body alone. That was the end of an entirely beautiful meditation on love and like how love moves from the realm of lust and sex into something more divine and something more all-encompassing. And it was genuinely some of not only the most beautiful writing I've ever read, but some of the most moving writing I've ever read. This book felt very philosophical and very meditational on certain subjects. It really moved out of the realm of historical fiction. This book is meant to be uh, from the perspective of the Roman Emperor Hadrian writing to his successor Marcus Aurelius, but this moved out of the realm of historical fiction for me quite rapidly uh, and just became a really interesting meditation on life and on different aspects of life. It was a really beautiful book, but I do want to say it's not a very straightforward historical fiction. I got this book used and someone had annotated it prior to me and all in the margins are just this person trying to put together the history of what was going on. Like he's trying to draw, I mean, family trees. He's trying to connect Hadrian and Trajan. He's trying to connect Trajan's wife to how Hadrian became emperor. And all of that is very interesting. And all of that is probably what you would expect to see in a historical fiction book. But that is not really the point of this book at all, in my opinion. And I think if you go into this not knowing much about Hadrian, I don't think you're going to leave it knowing more about him, except maybe on a personal level, because this book did feel very real to me in a way that a lot of historical fiction purporting to be a memoir does not. This really did feel like it could have come from Hadrian's mind. And so there was something very, very special here. But I think if you're walking into this expecting a more traditional or a more modern historical fiction is maybe the word. I don't think you're going to get that. But if you want just a genuinely beautiful book, pick this up because wow, it was incredible. Next, I picked up The Christie Affair by Nina de Gramont. And this is a historical fiction about this time in Agatha Christie's life when she went missing for around 10 days. And this is a mystery that has never been solved. She always claimed in her lifetime that she didn't really remember what happened or why she left. And so this book is kind of filling in the blanks, but I don't want to tell you any more than that. This book is not at all what you expect from that blurb. It's not what I thought it was going to be. And it was so much more brilliant for being something more than just that blurb. Uh, so Agatha Christie is not really the main character of this novel. And I think it was just 
such a brilliant read. I was so lost in this. I really could not stop thinking about it. This was just such an interesting character study. And it really reminded me in some ways of The Alice Network by Kate Quinn, which is one of my favorite historical fiction novels of all time. Really, there is nothing there to compare them, but just this sense of atmosphere and this sense of dread that you feel for the characters. And in a way, just feeling that the characters are so, so real to you. And of course, this book is dealing with actual historical figures, but it's dealing with them in a very fictional way. I'm sure that the author took a lot of liberties with what actually happened. And I am personally never going to look up the actual story. I don't want to know. I hope we never find out because I want to think that this book is what happened. I saw some early buzz about this, but I really haven't heard much else about it uh, since it initially came out, but I really liked it. I think this is going to be incredibly divisive. And I think if you are personally a really big fan of Agatha Christie, this one may not work for you. If you're someone who knows a lot about Agatha Christie personally and her life, I just think you might struggle with this as that's where I've seen the negative reviews come from. But I don't really know much about her. And so I just was happy to go along for the ride. This was a really interesting and it is in so many ways really historical fiction. That is something to keep in mind. She took definitely a lot of liberties. Even though I don't know the whole story, I can tell there was a lot of this that she made up. But this is another of my favorites of the year so far. So I'm really hoping I'm emerging out of my slump and apparently historical fiction is going to be the way to go. And so last but not least is truly my top three of the year. So my top three of the year have happened this month. Damien, uh, The Memoirs of Hadrian, and now Booth by Karen Joy Fowler. This is an absolutely incredible historical fiction book about the Booth family. And there is a member of the Booth family who is very, very famous today, and that is John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth uh, is the man who assassinated US President Abraham Lincoln. And so he is definitely the most famous member of the family today. But during their lifetime, there were many famous Booths. And so this book, just really takes you through the entire family and all of John Wilkes's siblings because Karen Joy Fowler apparently did not want this book to focus on John Wilkes Booth at all. And so he is kind of a footnote to the family story, which I just loved. There's enough of him in here that you get a handle on him as a person, but I really just loved the whole entire family. I was fascinated by this. I was really lost in this. This took me to a different world entirely because the Booths are a theater family. Their father, Junius, was a massively famous Shakespearean actor. Uh, and so most of the family actually did go into acting and was also quite famous in the theater realm. But so there's always this undertone of kind of dramaticism and theatricality to the writing of this book and to the interactions of the characters. And the characters even kind of talk about this. How can you grow up in a Shakespearean household and not have great dreams for yourself and not be so dramatic and not feel things so deeply? How can you grow up in a Shakespearean household without feeling mad? But there's also this real fairy tale like quality to it. This truly feels like you were going to a different place when you pick this book up. And it doesn't even feel like you're going to pre Civil War America. Like it just feels like an entirely different world. Even though she does comment on the things that are happening in the lead up to the Civil War. Uh, and Lincoln's story is kind of interspersed with this, which was really interesting. Even though that happens, it's like the Booths live in their own world and are not really conceptualizing what's going on other than John Wilkes. John Wilkes was certainly into the politics of it all. But this just felt like a really magical and dreamy book about some people that are really quite terrible. Really, a lot of the Booths were not good people. But I was just so lost in this and so enthralled with them. Uh, and I would read another book about the Booths tomorrow. This was also just extremely beautifully written. There were elements of this that I think really elevated this for me that I don't think I can talk about. I don't think I can say. I think they would be spoilers. But I do wanna say that I think the book has been marketed wrongly. I picked this up on Book of the Month and it said on there, this is a historical fiction about John Wilkes Booth. And when you look it up online, I think that's often the connection that people are making about the book is like, oh, Booth, it's gotta be about John Wilkes Booth and uh, the assassination. 
that's not really what this book is about and that's not what Karen Joy Fowler wanted the book to be about. And so I think some people are going to be really disappointed when they pick this up and they realize that John Wilkes is not the main character of this book. It really kind of alternates throughout the siblings, which was just fascinating and was the ideal way to do it. I loved this. This was five stars and I just think it was amazing. I mean, genuinely amazing historical fiction. And since it is very literary in tone, it also kind of gave me Hilary Mantel vibes. So it was similarly magical in a similar way to Wolf Hall. Like I think Wolf Hall feels so fairy tale like so does Booth. So this is one that I highly recommend and I actually recommend it over the Christie Affair. I think the Christie Affair will work for a lot of people, but I think it also will be a very contentious read. I think Booth is interesting in so many different ways because I think you learn a lot throughout it. You learn a lot of factoids that she as the author decides to throw in, which is really interesting, but you also just love being in the orbit of the booths, if only for a little while. They're so enigmatic and charming in that way, even though you know on an objective level they're terrible people for the most part, but you just really enjoy spending this amount of time with them. So those were all of the books that I read in March. I am hoping that maybe this is a sign that I am finally getting over my really massive slump. But I would love to know if you have read any of these and what you read in the month of March. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.